Part 1. Chapter 1. Defining Illness All illnesses, save those having emotional or functional causes, are expressions of cellular derangements. Stanley L. Robbins, M.D. The physician's task is to diagnose and treat disease. The vast literature of medicine catalogs the countless characteristics of diverse diseases and the various methods used for detecting and treating them. Despite the incredible outpouring of human labor devoted to this enterprise, and despite the fact that virtually all medical efforts, diagnostic and therapeutic, epidemiological and investigative, presuppose an understanding of and agreement about what constitutes disease, physicians and non-physicians alike often neglect to define disease or worse, tacitly accept some temporarily fashionable definition. Because the concept of mental illness borrows from and leans on the concept of bodily illness, it is impossible to clarify the meaning of the former term without first coming to grips with the meaning of the latter. Accordingly, in this chapter, I shall try to systematically articulate what we mean, and also what, if we want to be precise, we ought to mean when we speak about illness. It is often objected that scrutinizing the semantics of illness is a waste of time because it addresses only words and does not affect the reality of diseases. According to this view, widely held today, cancer is an illness and it exists regardless of what we call it. Similarly, schizophrenia is an illness and it too exists regardless of what we call it. I shall let this objection, which embodies a dangerous fallacy, stand for the moment and refute it gradually as I go along. In his everyday work, the practicing physician diagnoses and treats many conditions that do not qualify as objectively identifiable or identified diseases. People who consult physicians complain of discomforts that may or may not be the manifestations of abnormal bodily processes. Moreover, if we consider the diseases diagnosed and treated by psychiatrists who, and this is very important, are physicians, then the definition of disease as a structural or functional abnormality of the human body is obviously too narrow. Actually, physicians attend to a variety of problems. 1. Aches and pains, such as of the head or back. 2. Complaints about the body's behavior, such as insomnia or constipation. And 3. The behavior of the person who owns or inhabits his body, such as eating too much or too little, drinking too much, being pregnant without wanting to be, and so forth. Are these, shall we say, phenomena, the name is important because it is likely to prejudge our attitude, also diseases? We shall see. Suffice it to say for now that, in an inquiry such as ours, answering this question prematurely would be a mistake. If we answer yes, we start down the perilous road of elasticizing the concept of disease so that it becomes monstrously large, as it in fact now is. If we answer no, we merely re-emphasize the familiar distinctions between bodily disease and mental disease without helping us grapple with the ambiguities inherent in both the professional and lay definitions of disease. Hence, it is best to withhold judgment and use the question, are diseases diseases, as a philosophical and semantic bridge to higher ground from which to survey the pandemonium below. What is disease? The question, what is disease may seem stupid because everyone now knows or thinks he knows the answer. Everyone can name a particular phenomenon that, he is quite sure, is a disease, for example, cancer, diabetes, AIDS. These are certainly diseases, but why? To this question, the answer is by no means obvious. Many people now say that these conditions are diseases because they disable and kill people. So do terrorism and war. Are they diseases too? I believe we must begin with a clarification of the idea of illness or disease. I use these two terms interchangeably, precisely because everyone knows what it is, if only through the notoriously fallible formula, I know it when I see it. To my mind, there is an alarming similarity between the present popular concept of disease and certain previous popular concepts, such as hell or witch. Everyone knew what they were too. Whenever masses of people, especially educated people, know something. And when what they know is something they greatly fear because they believe it affects virtually everything they do or want to do, then most likely we stand in the presence of a vast falsehood. Why do we construct definitions of concepts and categories? Why the periodic table of elements? Why the taxonomy of plants and animals? Why distinguish between killing and murder? 
Mutatis mutandis, why do we define disease? Why should we distinguish between being ill and being mentally ill? Classification is usually said to serve one or more of three interconnected aims. One, to help us understand, order, and communicate information. Two, to establish jurisdiction or boundaries, for example, between human beings and animals, what is edible and not edible, what is therapeutic and noxious, and three, to establish legitimacy and thus facilitate control of the environment, animate as well as inanimate. Only in the hardest of the hard sciences, and only where notation is basically mathematical, do definitions serve the first purpose exclusively. In other academic pursuits, the practical professions, and everyday discourse, definitions serve all three goals. It is precisely this multi-purpose character of our definitions and criteria of illness and mental illness that make a clear cataloging of the various meanings of the term illness imperative. We must, therefore, begin with an examination of the ways we use this term. Defining the class called disease. To begin with, the word disease is the name of a class. And what is a class? It is a group or set of persons, things, or qualities possessing common characteristics. Examples of classes of persons are males, females, children, doctors, Americans. Examples of classes of things are stones, trees, houses, cars, radios. Examples of classes of characteristics are pains, pleasures, discomforts, sufferings. What kind of class does the word disease refer to? Negative answers come more easily to mind than positive ones. Clearly, diseases are not persons. Are they then things? Well, some diseases seem to be things. For example, when a person has an unsightly blemish or growth on the surface of his body, say a basal cell carcinoma on his nose, the individual so affected may regard the lesion as a thing. He may ask his doctor, can't you take this thing off? Medical students, too, are trained, at least initially, to view diseases as things. They dissect cadavers, which are things. Cadavers have diseased organs, cancerous livers, tuberculous lungs, which are also things. Although this is a good way to begin identifying what we mean by disease, it is only a beginning. For clearly, the class we conventionally call disease comprises many members that are not things, at least not in the sense that they are material objects like bodies or organs. What they are is something much more subtle, which perhaps is the source of a good deal of the confusion about this subject. Consider diseases such as diabetes or essential hypertension. These are not material objects that can be seen or touched or removed from the body, like a melanoma of the skin. Instead, they are the names of processes that because of their consequences, we deem to be abnormal or pathological. Medical scientists now view virtually all diseases as pathological processes with symptoms, signs, and visible and tangible lesions, such as an abscess, as their consequences. So far, we have identified the sorts of items that comprise the core concept of disease, abnormal bodies, organs, tissues, cells, and physiological processes. I shall call these items bodily diseases or real diseases or simply diseases. These, of course, are the diseases that non-psychiatric physicians diagnose and treat. As I have noted, some classes are composed of persons, others of things, and still others of qualities. What about the various states of personal discomfort, grief, or suffering that plague mankind? Are these diseases? Or are they diseases only if they are the symptoms of bodily abnormalities, as they sometimes are? Obviously, there is no merit in arguing about definitions, but there is a good deal of merit in being clear about them and honest about their consequences. Kenneth Minogue wisely warns that whatever taxonomy one may adopt, it cannot profitably be discussed except by taking some fairly decisive steps right at the beginning. Let us honestly identify these steps. Psychiatrists and all those steeped in the psychiatric ideology take the decisive initial step of omitting to define illness in general or bodily illness in particular and instead define mental illness, whatever they mean by it, as a member of the class called illness. I reject this approach. Instead of accepting the phenomena called mental illnesses as diseases, the decisive initial step I take is to define illness as the pathologist defines it, as a structural or functional abnormality of cells, tissues, organs, or bodies. If the phenomena called mental illnesses manifest themselves as such structural or functional abnormalities, then they are diseases. If they do not, they are not. Unless we exercise such candor, 
we shall stand in perpetual danger of confusing definition with discovery. What counts as illness? How do we know whether something is or is not an illness? Is alcoholism an illness? Or obesity? Or self-starvation? Is a pregnant woman who wants an abortion sick? Or a young man who commits a sensational crime ostensibly to impress a movie star? Questions such as these now crowd in on us from every side. Let us therefore continue our attempt to map the entire meaning of disease by making a list of the sorts of persons who are now viewed by professionals and lay people alike as having an illness. One person's displaying overt or hidden signs of a bodily abnormality, for example, jaundice or persistently elevated blood pressure. Two, persons complaining of being ill, for example, of persistent headache or progressive weight loss. Three persons complaining of a troubling condition or propensity, for example, homosexuality or agoraphobia. Four, persons complaining of or said to be exhibiting insufficient self-control, for example, the alcoholic or compulsive gambler. Five, persons committing shocking crimes, for example, killing their own children, parents, or spouses. I shall now briefly comment on each of these criteria. Criteria of illness. One proven or demonstrated lesion. The criterion is a lesion that may be obvious to the naked eye, for example, bleeding or jaundice, or it may be demonstrable only with special instruments, for example, a blood count, x-rays, the electrocardiogram. This is the core concept of what constitutes disease. Two, putative or suspected lesion. The criterion is still a lesion, but the lesion is postulated rather than proved. Typically, its presence is inferred from certain clinical evidence. As the disease progresses, it is expected to advance to a stage where the presence of a lesion can be proven. Before the advent of modern diagnostic technology, diseases such as neurosyphilis or myocardial infarction could not, in their early stages, be securely diagnosed or differentiated from complaints that merely mimicked their CIRM teams. The fallacy, popular today, that all conditions to which we now attach the name of an illness are putative diseases which will, with the advance of science, turn out to be proven diseases, is based on this historical transformation of suspected diseases into proven diseases. Three suffering, causing suffering, and occupying the patient role. The criterion is not a lesion, but a complaint interpreted as having a bodily medical reference. For example, according to authoritative medical opinion today, a pregnant woman who wants to be pregnant is not considered to be ill, whereas a pregnant woman who does not want to be pregnant is, and abortion is considered to be a treatment for her illness. The basic intellectual fact, writes a physician working in a Colorado abortion center, is that pregnancy is an illness for which there are various kinds of treatment. Similarly, a homosexual satisfied with his sexual orientation is not considered to be ill, but if he is dissatisfied with his sexual orientation, then he is considered to be ill, suffering from a disease called egodystonic homosexuality. Suffering may also be imputed to an uncomplaining person designated as a patient, for example, to an individual with so-called grandiose delusions who is then said to be suffering from schizophrenia. Occupying the sick patient role by assuming it voluntarily or by being assigned to it involuntarily is the criterion that qualifies the occupant's alleged condition as a bona fide illness. Because suffering, whether self-avowed or imputed, is an especially important criterion of illness, I shall say more about it presently. 4. Bad habits, dangerousness to self. These criteria are unrelated to the body, except insofar as the body is involved in anything we do, from studying mathematics to playing baseball. Nevertheless, certain personally or socially disapproved behaviors, especially when they eventuate in bodily harm to the individual who engages in them, are now conventionally classified as diseases. For example, Soviet psychiatrists find that persons who cannot or do not control their displeasure with the political system of their own country suffer from creeping schizophrenia, while American psychiatrists find that persons who do not control their greed when in a casino suffer from pathological gambling. Similarly, an article in Science is tellingly titled Obesity Declared a Disease, while another, in the New York Times Magazine, explains that alcoholism is an illness. Alcoholism is generally defined as a disease in which the victim has lost control over drinking, 
although he may want to, he is unable on his own to stop drinking. Anorexia, bulimia, drug abuse, smoking, and many other contemporary diseases fall into this category. 5. Criminality, dangerousness to others. The criterion used for diagnosing persons who commit certain sensational crimes as suffering from a bona fide illness, typically a mental illness, is similar to the criterion previously used. Instead of being dangerous to himself, the person is said to be dangerous to others. That the madman is dangerous is, of course, a time-honored idea. This fear is steadily reinforced by the fact that, as nearly everyone realizes, conscience and civilization form only a fragile shield against the violence that lurks in the human mind. Given this ever-present fear of the dangerous other, modern man welcomes the idea of insanity of mental illness as a disease, as a supposedly scientific explanation of murder and mayhem. This is why, despite its nonsensical character, the view that only crazy people commit crazy crimes enjoys a large measure of intellectual respectability. See Chapter 8. Of course, the belief that crazy people who do crazy things suffer from a lesion of the central nervous system rests on nothing more than a leap of faith. That they suffer from a condition not so caused, but nevertheless properly called an illness, rests on a metaphorical use of the term illness. This particular extended use of the term illness is now amazingly popular in the United States. No longer is only the violent madman considered to be sick. Everyone who is violent is now viewed as sick. C. Everett Koop, the Surgeon General of the United States, has declared, Violence is every bit a public health issue for me and my successors in this century as smallpox, tuberculosis, and syphilis were for my predecessors in the last two centuries. Indeed, the United States Center for Disease Control, CDC, in Atlanta has a division called Violence Epidemiology Branch, which according to a story in American Medical News, is giving priority to the issue murder, considering homicide to be a disease of epidemic proportions. Obviously, if we accept every one of the foregoing as a legitimate criterion of illness, we inflate the meaning of the word illness and its synonyms, such as disease and disorder, the latter being the latest psychiatric catchword. I shall not belabor this point. However, since psychiatrists often claim that experiencing suffering from almost any cause is itself sufficient warranty for regarding the subject as suffering from a disease, I want to offer some additional remarks on this subject. Suffering as a criterion of illness. As a personal experience and social problem, suffering is clearly not a purely medical concern. Indeed, in modern English, we use words derived from the ancient Greek term for suffering, pathos, to refer not only to certain phenomena conceptualized as diseases, but also to certain human experiences. For example, we use terms like pathetic or sympathetic to talk about matters unrelated to medicine or psychiatry, and terms like pathology and psychopathology to talk about bodily and mental diseases. Actually, only in earlier times, when efforts to heal spirit and body were united in an undifferentiated priestly medical enterprise, were physicians interested in suffering qua suffering. Today, physicians are interested in suffering only as a symptom pointing to an underlying disease. Traditionally, the problem of suffering has been the business of priests and religions. In the modern world, it has also become the business of politicians and the state. Revealingly, contemporary textbooks of medicine, surgery, pathology, or even therapeutics do not even mention suffering. References to suffering abound, however, in theological texts and in works about religion. For example, in Problems of Suffering in Religions of the World, John Bowker states that, There are few better ways of coming to understand the religions of the world than by studying what response they make to the common experience of suffering. Regarding the role of suffering in Judaism, he writes, Here is perhaps the supreme contribution of Israel to a human response to suffering, that suffering can be redemptive, that it can be the foundation of better things. In Christianity, the redemptive role of suffering is raised higher still. In Paul's experience, discipleship of Christ involves suffering. Thus, suffering is an important part of identification with Christ. Although redemptive suffering came initially from God or was self-inflicted, suffering inflicted on others also became redemptive in principle and hence justifiable in practice. 
In the 16th century, for example, there were three benefits which it was thought might justify the imposition of suffering on others. The unity of the state, the purity of the church, and the hoped-for repentance and salvation of those on whom suffering was inflicted. Clearly, this passage is pregnant with portentous implications for our own day when the task of relieving and inflicting suffering belongs to the clinician rather than the clergyman. Moreover, since the clinician is increasingly an agent of the state, receiving not only his license to practice, but also his salary from the state, or from third parties under the control of public agencies, we now find ourselves confronted with an intimate alliance between medicine and the state. Institutional psychiatry, let us not forget, owes its origin and present importance wholly to the state, that is, to the fact that it is a service sought and paid for by persons other than the designated mental patient. Typically, the service is sought by the designated patient's relatives and is paid for by the taxpayer. With its progressive removal from the free market, medicine has assumed many of the economic and political features and problems that have long characterized psychiatry. This is why diagnosis and therapy are now increasingly politicized and politics is increasingly medicalized. How has medicine, and especially psychiatry, become so entangled with the state, or more specifically with politics qua diagnosis and therapy? Briefly put, the answer to this question lies in the modern, liberal perspective on government, which instead of seeing the state as a threat to liberty, perceives it as a protection against poverty, disease, and other threats inherent in the vicissitudes of life. As Kenneth Minogue has elegantly described, the liberal identifies himself with the paternalistic state, wants to help, and therefore needs people who need help. Since no one needs help more than the person who suffers, the liberal, writes Minogue, adopts an intellectual device which interprets events in terms of what we may perhaps call suffering situations. Moreover, since for the liberal suffering situations justify the most far-reaching coercions imposed by agencies of the state from taxing some to forcing unwanted help on others, he will feel strongly inclined to impute suffering, or at least a history of suffering, to any person or group he wants to help. The result is the theory of implied suffering, exemplified by the psychiatric perspective that purports to see suffering in the behavior of persons who smoke, drink, and gamble, all of which are now officially designated as mental diseases. Marching under the banner of this theory, the contemporary psychiatrist has occupied every nook and cranny of human behavior. Wherever he looks, he sees suffering requiring his ministrations. Some people are said to suffer because they say they do and because they seek help. Others are said to suffer, although they do not say they do and may even deny suffering and refuse psychiatric or other help because they exhibit behavior psychiatrists call cries for help. It goes without saying that all such cries are directed toward psychiatrists, who are eager to respond, provided the state authorizes them to impose their help on unwilling clients and pays them to do so. Who defines disease? All too often, the problem of defining disease is debated as if it were a question of science, medicine, or logic. By doing so, we ignore the fact that definitions are made by persons, that different persons have different interests, and hence that differing definitions of disease may simply reflect the divergent interests and needs of the definers. Language is an instrument or tool. This is why, if an activity such as music or sports interests us, we have a rich vocabulary for it, and if it does not interest us, we have a poor vocabulary for it, or none at all. It is no accident that mama and dada are among the first words children learn. Similarly, as semanticists like to point out, because snow is very important for the Eskimo, the Eskimo language has many different words for identifying a variety of snowy conditions. For us, snow is not so important, and we have only a few words for it. Disease, however, is important for us, and we have many words for it. The list of medical terms identifying different diseases, from alopecia to zoophobia, must run into the thousands, with the names of new diseases constantly being added. As we are a medically-minded people who value the diagnosis and treatment of disease, this rich vocabulary is useful to us in much the same way that the rich vocabulary of snow is useful to the Eskimo. However, 
In our effort to understand illness in purely medical terms, we have stumbled into a great confusion. We have done so because of a stubborn refusal to see that although the idea of illness is rooted in a medical context, certain non-medical, for example, moral, economic, and political factors play a decisive role in imparting meaning to it. Every profession possesses a specialized language created by and for the particular professionals serving their own purposes and legitimized by the authority they enjoy. To see how the medical, psychiatric, and popular definitions of illness differ, let us first see how, for example, the chemical, economic, and popular definitions of, say, gold differ. If we asked, what is gold? The chemist might say, it is an element with certain chemical and physical characteristics whose atomic number is 79. The economist, that it is a precious metal traditionally used as a monetary medium worth so many dollars per ounce. And the man on the street, that it is the material out of which elegant and expensive jewelry is made, or perhaps that it is a protection against economic and political uncertainties. In short, for the chemist, gold is an element, for the economist, a medium of exchange, and for the man on the street, a thing of beauty or a source of security. For each, the term gold has a different meaning. The idea of illness can likewise be understood only if we are willing to entertain similar distinctions with reference to who uses it and for what purpose. For the pathologist, and for most physicians most of the time, illness is a disordered state or function of the body. If pressed, physicians might specify the anatomical or physiological characteristics of various disorders, such as myocardial infarction or hypertension. For the patient, illness is a feeling of discomfort or the experience of disability perceived as originating in the body. If pressed, patients might specify the experiential characteristics of various disorders, such as chill, fever, or pain. Thus, doctor and patient both tell us what disease is, each from his own perspective. We might say that physicians and medical organizations define and determine what constitute diseases and treatments, while patients and other non-medical persons define and determine which particular discomforts they consider to be troublesome enough to require medical attention and which treatments they regard as beneficial. Two types of illness, organic and psychological. Today, the standard medical criteria for determining what is a disease are of two kinds, deviations from biological norms and deviations from social norms. The former group comprises so-called bodily or physical diseases, such as cancer and heart disease. The latter, so-called mental or psychiatric diseases, such as depression and schizophrenia. The medical criteria for determining what constitutes treatment are likewise of two kinds, physiological or physicochemical, and psychological or sociocultural. The former group comprises the so-called organic methods of treatment, the latter, the psychosocial methods. It must be kept in mind that each of these definitions rests on the authority of the person or group that makes them, that each varies with the interpretations and decisions of those who make them, that each serves the purposes of those who make them, and most importantly for our purposes, that mental illnesses are now defined as diseases. In this view, mental diseases are members of the class called illness. These definitions are useful partly as guides for helping the sick, and partly as guideposts to the definer's ideas and intentions. For example, although it had long been known that syphilis was a disease, during the early years of the First World War, British military physicians defined it as a crime incurred as a result of deliberately careless or illicit sexual intercourse. On the other hand, although it had long been known that sometimes persons fake the manifestations of illness and that such counterfeit diseases must be distinguished from real diseases. Toward the end of the 19th century, physicians declared that these imitations were themselves illnesses. When X is not really X, if we keep our eyes and ears open, we encounter problems similar to the problem of what counts or does not count as illness wherever we turn. Claims advanced as if they were reasoned arguments and framed typically in the form X is not really X appear almost daily in the newspapers. In a single two-day period, I came across three typical stories. The first, titled, Daughter Disowned After Marrying Gentile, is an Associated Press report about a young Jewish-Canadian woman 
who married a non-Jewish man on August 23, 1984. A few days later, her parents placed their daughter's obituary in the Weekly Jewish Post newspaper, requesting that no condolences be sent or memorials made. According to Canadian civil authorities, this woman was very much alive. According to her parents and the Orthodox Jewish community to which they belong, she was quite dead. Is she really alive or dead? In the second story, the question is not whether a certain person is alive or not, but whether certain persons are Jews or not. On March 25, 1985, a combined United Press Associated Press release reported that Ethiopia has demanded the return of thousands of Ethiopian Jews transported to Israel in a secret airlift, saying they are not really Jewish and had been abducted, emphasis added. According to Israeli authorities, the starving Ethiopians airlifted to Israel are Jews, according to Ethiopian authorities, they are not Jews. Are these people really Jews or non-Jews? The third story, appearing in the same paper on the same day, is about a 63-year-old man who divorced his wife of 18 years in preparation for becoming a priest. The report cited Loyola University law professor James Forkins, an authority on family law and the Catholic Church, explaining that the man got divorced just to be sure, but in the eyes of the church, he had never been married because he did not have a church wedding. Clearly, it would be pointless to ask whether this man was ever really married. Controversies of this type are not limited to religious and psychiatric authorities and their civil or legal counterparts. They are ubiquitous, and no individual or organization is immune to them. For example, the introduction of new legislation authorizing the execution of criminals sentenced to death by means of a lethal injection of drugs has prompted the American Pharmaceutical Association, whose members ought to know better, to declare that certain drugs are not really drugs. According to a report in American Medical News, the American Medical Association's official weekly newspaper, in order to help pharmacists who do not want to participate in executions, the American Pharmaceutical Association's House of Delegates decided that a drug used for lethal injection is not really a drug because it is not a medicine for the treatment, cure, or prevention of disease, emphasis added. Among the non-drugs used for such injections are potassium chloride, succinylcholine, decamethonium, sodium thiopental, and D2-bocurarine. Here is one more example to illustrate that no sooner do we define class X by certain descriptive criteria than we decide, typically on purely strategic grounds, that some members of X are not really members of that class. See Chapter 9. In the United States today, some banks are called non-banks. The uncertain legal status of these institutions was settled in January 1986 when the Supreme Court ruled that non-banks can provide banking services. In a report titled, Fed Loses Non-Bank Bank Case, the New York Times explained that non-bank banks function much like full-service banks, but limit their activities in order to skirt the statutory definition of banks and thereby avoid restrictions on interstate banking and other regulations. In short, whether a certain condition or conduct is viewed as disease, be it diabetes or depression, pellagra or pregnancy, may depend on whether the patient so defines it, whether the physician and the medical profession so define it, or whether the state so defines it. The same goes for treatment, be it penicillin or prayer, circumcision or conversation. However, in ordinary speech and practice, we designate all manner of conditions and interventions simply as illness and treatment, without bothering to identify who defines what and why. For example, at the beginning of this century, some women wanted contraceptive advice and asked other women for it. The voluntary participants in this transaction defined their goal as the preservation of the woman's health from unwanted pregnancies. The government defined it as a crime and prosecuted the dispensers of birth control information. Today, the government offers the same service, and some of those who now object to it call the measure genocide. Obviously, it is pointless to ask what birth control really is, a crime, a health measure, pregnancy prevention, or genocide. It is each of these from the point of view of certain persons or groups. It is possible, of course, to define illness as a condition identified by the patient, just as it is possible to define it as a condition identified by the physician. However, 
the former definition would mean that every individual who asserts that he is ill would have to be viewed and treated as ill, and every individual who asserts that he is not ill would have to be viewed and treated as not ill, a patently absurd proposition and program. But there is no need to go to such extremes. It is enough to acknowledge who defines what and controls whom. For example, in the typical case of bodily illness, say myocardial infarction, the subject identifies himself as suffering from an illness, and so does his physician. Whereas in the typical case of mental illness, say schizophrenia, the psychiatrist identifies the subject as ill, but the subject does not identify himself as ill. In the case of malingering, the subject identifies himself as ill, an identification the physician rejected in the past, but now accepts, qualifying the illness as mental. Let me run through this once more. I am suggesting that it is one thing to assay a piece of ore for its gold content, and quite another to dictate the value of the gold in it. Likewise, it is one thing to assay the nature of a physicochemical disorder of a human body, and quite another to dictate how its owner should conduct himself with respect to it. The first task requires knowledge or technical competence. Whether or not a person possesses knowledge or technical competence is a matter of fact or opinion. The second task requires power or control over persons. Whether or not it is legitimate to use power over people is a matter of ethics and politics. To appreciate the importance of these considerations requires making a clear distinction between an abnormal biological condition of the body called disease and the assumption of the social role of the sick person called patient, a subject one shall discuss in the next chapter. The regrettable fact that this distinction is now so confused, especially in the minds of physicians, is not my fault, but the fault of the medical profession. Chemists are satisfied with studying and trying to understand the chemical properties of gold and offering their services to clients who want them. But physicians are not satisfied with studying and trying to understand abnormal bodily processes and offering their services to clients who want them, but also insist on defining the patient role and determining the legitimacy of a host of health-related matters. This is a blunder for which all of us, doctors and patients alike, are paying a heavy price. To understand and perhaps undo this mistake, we must attend to and honestly acknowledge the diverse interests of the various moral agents, physician, patient, politician, judge, who may have the authority to define disease. Yet it seems to me that we ignore that, especially in the United States, judges often determine what counts as a disease. For example, in 1985, the policy of a New Jersey high school requiring all students to submit to urine tests for illegal drug use was ruled unconstitutional on the ground that drug use is a medical illness like diabetes, cancer, or AIDS. Clearly, the term medical illness in this sentence does not refer to a scientific or medical concept. Judges are neither scientists nor doctors. Instead, they are experts on and arbiters of legal fictions, see Chapter 11. A judge cannot, does not, and is not expected to determine whether a particular piece of ore is radioactive or whether a particular skin lesion is a melanoma. What a judge can do, does do, and is expected to do is decide which legal fictions we must accept as social realities. If then, judges determine, as they often do in the United States, but not necessarily in other countries, what is and what is not a disease, then we must realize that the term disease stands, among other things, for one of our important legal fictions. In addition, we must recognize that not only may different parties define disease differently, but that there is a crucial difference between having the authority to define disease and having the power to impose one's definition on someone else. For example, physicians on patients, patients on family members, judges on physicians or hospitals, legislators on everyone else. Finally, we must distinguish between possessing the expertise to deliver treatment and the means of doing so, from possessing the political power to impose treatment on those who do not want it, or to extract it from those who do not want to give it. These are simple distinctions. If we fail to make them, it is because we prefer to pursue hidden agendas of domination and submission concealed by a rhetoric of disease and treatment. The core concept of disease. As we have seen, 
The meaning of disease, as this term is commonly used, is so broad and vague that it defies definition. The result is twofold. One is that instead of clear criteria for counting or not counting something as a disease, we have endless exemplifications of it. The other is that the category called disease is perfectly elastic, accommodating virtually anything anyone wants to place in it, including metaphoric diseases, see Chapter 5. However, if we scrutinize what non-psychiatric medical researchers and specialists do, we see an ever more sophisticated search for and identification of anatomical and physiological lesions, such as those obtained by means of computerized axial tomography, CAT scan, and novel immunological techniques, and a similar search for and identification of the physicochemical causes of novel lesions, for example, the bacillus causing Legionnaire's disease or the virus causing AIDS. Thus, now more than ever before, the core concept of illness is bodily disease. If this were not so, why would psychiatric researchers be looking for the chemical lesions of schizophrenia and the pharmacological cures of mania? Not surprisingly, while medical researchers press forward in their search for bodily lesions, psychiatric researchers outdo each other in their efforts to obscure what constitutes disease. The following remarks by Samuel Guz, a professor of psychiatry at Washington University in St. Louis, are pertinent in this connection. Most medical textbooks do not attempt to define disease, and most physicians never show much interest in the problem, suggesting either that the definition is unimportant or that they intuitively grasp its meaning and can therefore get on with more interesting questions. Because of these observations, it was proposed by Guze himself that any condition associated with discomfort, pain, disability, death, or an increased liability in these states, regarded by physicians and the public as properly the responsibility of the medical profession, may be considered a disease. This elastic definition of disease leads to the gradual incorporation of many personal and social problems into the concern of medicine, a trend Guz enthusiastically endorses. It is, of course, precisely this process of medicalization that underlies and supports psychiatry as a medical specialty a subject discussed throughout this book. Suffice it to add here that the socially relativistic and morally uncritical nature of such a definition, which, incidentally, is not at all novel, invites the use of medical rhetoric and justifies resorts to coercive interventions to solve vexing social problems. Thus, about a century and a half ago, the idea of illness Guza now endorses was used to define black slaves who tried to run away to freedom as suffering from a disease called drapetomania and to justify their torture as treatment. Authoritative definitions of disease, dictionaries, and textbooks of pathology. To identify the core meaning of disease, we must finally look to two types of authorities and sources. One, students of language and students of disease. Two, dictionaries and textbooks of pathology. Let us see what they tell us. Most English dictionaries list disease as the first and most general meaning of the word disease. Once past this obstacle, they all define disease as a disorder of the material structure or function of a living body. For example, the Oxford English Dictionary, OED, defines disease as a condition of the body or some part or organ of the body in which its functions are disturbed or deranged. In a subsequent entry, there appears this significant addendum. Fig a deranged, depraved, or morbid condition of mind or disposition of the affairs of the community, etc. In other words, the OED explicitly defines mental illness as a figurative or metaphoric illness. The revised first edition of Webster's New International Dictionary of the English Language, 1897, defines disease as follows. An alteration in the state of the body or of some of its organs, interrupting or disturbing the performance of the vital functions, and causing or threatening pain and weakness, malady, affection, illness, sickness, disorder, applied figuratively to the mind, to the moral character and habits, to institutions, the state, etc. Surely, there is no need to belabor this. The medical definition of disease is its literal meaning. Applying the term to the mind, moral character, habits, and so forth are its metaphorical meanings. The third, most recent edition of Webster's New International Dictionary 1961, defines disease as an impairment of the normal state of the living animal or plant body or of any of its components 
that interrupts or modifies the performance of the vital functions. Sickness and illness are listed as synonyms. Interestingly, illness is defined as an unhealthy condition of body or mind. Stedman's Medical Dictionary defines disease as follows. Morbus, illness, sickness, an interruption or perversion of function of any of the organs, an acquired morbid change in any tissue of an organism or throughout an organism. Even more remarkable are the definitions of disease offered by the physicians most specifically concerned with the material basis of disease, namely pathologists. For example, Stanley L. Robbins, professor of pathology at Boston University School of Medicine, whose pathologic basis of disease is one of the standard texts used in medical schools, begins his 1592-page work with these words. The emerging physician is told so often, be concerned with the whole patient, that he sometimes forgets that behind every organic illness, there are malfunctioning cells. Indeed, it is more correct to say that when a sufficient number of cells become sick, so does the patient. All illnesses then, save those having emotional or functional causes, are expressions of cellular derangements, emphasis added. Note the pathologist's firm disavowal of mental illnesses as real, that is, cellular diseases. Interestingly, this passage appears only in the first edition, published in 1974. In the third edition, published in 1984, the claim that mental illness is an illness is rejected indirectly rather than explicitly. Pathology, we are told, is the medical discipline that deals with the study of deviations from normal structure, physiology, biochemistry, and cellular and molecular biology. Psychiatry is conspicuous by its absence from this list. If I have dwelled unduly on defining disease, it was for a good reason. Since the idea of mental illness borrows from, leans on, and cannot be analyzed independently from the popular and professional uses of the term illness, it would be foolish to dive into that subject, head first as it were, without making sure there is water in the pool. Faced with the idea of illness, modern man despite, or perhaps because of, his desperate dependence on a sophisticated, highly technological medical system, is like a primitive person who has no concept of paternity. Such a person does not understand the role of the male in human procreation, and hence cannot understand what the term father means. How could one explain to him the differences between two kinds of fathers, that is, between men so-called because they have begot children, and men so-called because they have become priests? Since such a person does not know what literal fathers are, he cannot know what metaphorical fathers are. Similarly, so long as we do not know, or do not want to know, what literal illnesses are, because we refuse to define disease in an operationally meaningful way, we cannot know what metaphorical illnesses are. See chapter 5. Hence, if we want to understand the idea of mental illness, we must first establish and agree on what belongs, and what does not belong, in the class called bodily illness, and why.